Good morning, homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. I'm out here in the big garden, and so this is part two of the June garden tour. And it is about eight in the morning, a beautiful day, and I'll show you what's happening in early June. So as a reminder, we are in Southeast Washington, zone 7A. Last frost, the first weekend in May, first frost the mid-October typically, sometimes as late as November, but not usually. This is what I just referred to as the big garden. It is 16 or 1700 foot rows. I only have part of it planted this year. I'm scaling back my production this year. I sell through a local food hub and I process a lot of products for spice mixes that I make and sell which is why I have such a large garden. But this year we are scaling back and taking a little bit more time off. And so not quite as extensive. The only part of this that is planted, well, there's one row on the far side that I'll show you in a minute, starting with the sunflowers and then tomatoes. And then as we move across, you can see some tall stuff back there. We'll go look in a minute that has some Jerusalem artichoke and some rhubarb in it. Everything in between those two rows is planted out with crops. And then the rest of the garden is just fallow this year um, or very weedy that we have a lot of weeds happening. I do plan on pulling old drip tape and mowing some of this and replanting with some cover crop sometime this month, but that hasn't happened yet. It's just been plenty of other things going on. But let's start on the far end my irrigation is going right now. You might hear a little bit of a buzz. Let's start on the far end with these amazing reseeded poppies. If you remember from the May garden tour, wow, look at all the, the bees in there are just thick right now. Let's see if I can get a little closer there and show you guys that. They are just, that whole thing is just moving. So these are a Shirley poppy. There are many, many, many different kinds of poppies in the world. Many of them are used for ornamental purposes or for culinary purposes or for drug purposes because that's where opium comes from. But these are a Shirley poppy and I just love them and they do tend to reseed quite heavily in my climate. Most of these, as they reseed over time, will revert to the classic red color. I'm guessing the bees are in here for the pollen rather than the nectar. Poppies I don't think have a lot of nectar, but they do put out a ton of pollen. And I have taken so many pictures of these in the last week and so much video because it is just so gorgeous. This is actually where I'm standing directly in front of me. That's actually an aisle, not a row, but they had receded in there so heavily that I didn't want to mow it. And so I just left it and <laughs> I'm glad I did. This is probably the peak. Like this is honestly as blooming as I've seen it since I've been out here. So these are just spectacular. Look at this gorgeous double right here that has multiple bees on it. I mean, come on. So the poppies are a great success. I'm glad that I did not mow this. And as these go to seed, I will mow them down and we'll have more reseeds next year. But this has been really rewarding and a lot of fun. By the way, this yellow flower right here that's blooming, this is Western Salsify. So it is technically a weed, but it is edible. These shoots, before they open, are edible and are supposed to taste a little bit like an oyster. And then they bloom this really pretty little lovely yellow flower, which I also have a ton of pictures of this year. And then once they finish blooming, they have a puffball seed head 
that looks quite a bit like a dandelion. And so they're harmless. I just kind of let them do their thing. I've got them scattered all over this garden and no big deal. This row, I won't go through the details of, but this is Jerusalem artichoke and rhubarb. And then we've heavily mulched it with leaves. This was herbs and other things. And it's just gotten, it had gotten really, really weedy and overgrown. And so I am trying to smother some of the weeds that are in there. And unfortunately I see the grass is growing through that mulch because that's often what happens. So a somewhat failed experiment, but certainly better than it would be. This row is kind of a catch-all. So we've got a little bit of a bunch of things in here. Um, this is an extra tomato plant, my last tomato plant that I had. It is a Cherokee purple, and it was just one that I hadn't sold and hadn't given away, and so threw it in the ground. We'll see how she does, um, but kind of a filler space there. This is tobacco. And I had, at a seed swap that I put on every year, someone brought me some actual true tobacco seeds. So not nicotina, the ornamental flower, but an actual tobacco. And so I have six of these in here. Just out of curiosity, I'm not a smoker. I don't intend to do anything with it, but I just thought it was fun to try it out. And so I wanna see what the plants look like. Evidently spacing on these is a minimum, typically of two feet. And these are not two feet apart. Eh, they're close to two feet apart. So we'll see how they do. It might be a little tight, but I didn't want to give them any more room than I've already given them. So that's fun. This is a volunteer fever few that was in the aisle, got run over by the mower, and then I found it yesterday when I was out here planting, and so I moved it over so that it could recover. Fever few is very hard to kill. It's a perennial, a nice medicinal. It's good for migraine headaches, and it's lovely little flowers, so it's good in arrangements. And so I just left it. You can see my drip system is going here. This is called drip tape. And the drip comes out at the top, not at the bottom. And that helps those holes from getting plugged up. And these are spaced every eight inches. You can get them eight inches or 12 inches. And I like the eight because I have a sandy loam soil. And sometimes your spacing is based on the type of soil you have. If you have clay soil, you can get away with further distance because that clay is going to absorb that moisture more slowly and it's going to spread out into a wider area. When I have sandy loam soil, it's going to drain pretty quickly. And so eight inches is a better spacing. These are extra of some cherry rubecchia, so flowers. And then this is an echinacea that I grew from seed starting to really appreciate when you see big box store nursery product like how early they started those plants because most of these were all started around mid-march and gosh it takes a long time for those to get very big we are now the 5th of june 6th of june and uh, yeah not there yet so this is edamame so soybeans that are edible pods got thrown into this little strip which is about 10 or 15 feet some of these were saved seeds from last year. Some of them were just extras that I had, and I just had the extra space, so that's where those ended up this year. And then the rest of this row, along with some volunteers, are melons. And so I have six or seven different kinds of melons in here, and I put them in alphabetical order so that I could remember what everything was. They also have tags, but sometimes tags get lost. And so it'll be fun to see how this goes. What happens over time is these melons spread out and they start climbing into the aisle and for the first month or so I put them back into the growing area and then eventually they just start sprawling to the point where I can't keep them contained and so this will eventually become a giant weedy mess because I won't be able to mow in here um, but until that happens and then I plan on putting some cardboard down in between these are spaced five feet apart that's a volunteer sunflower right there that I just went ahead and left. There's a lot of weeds in here. This has been weeded with a weed hoe, but I've still got a lot of stuff coming in, including a whole lot of volunteer tomatillos. I believe this is a volunteer tomatillo or possibly a volunteer ground cherry. I have both that come up all over the place out here, but I've weeded this pretty heavily, but there's lots more coming, you can see. There's all kinds of baby weeds coming in there. So I'm gonna cardboard this, and I put the cardboard underneath the drip line, and that helps hold it down, and it just helps keep the weeds out of the aisles. Here is a volunteer potato that I left. There's another volunteer potato that I left. We had potatoes in here two years ago, and so these are potatoes that have lasted a couple of years. Here's a big pile of baby tomatillos. 
that I didn't weed out. And so lots of volunteers from the previous year. And sometimes I just move things around. Stuff like that will come up and it's in the wrong spot or I'll, and I weed it out. But sometimes I've got a hole someplace and I just move it and put it in a different location. Speaking of tobacco, can you see this guy? This is nicotina. And so this is a white flowering ornamental plant that blooms in the evenings and so it smells absolutely amazing and it's lovely for the pollinators and so this I've had this going for many 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 years and it randomly reseeds and I usually move a few of these around the garden and then they reseed in a new place the following year I just haven't dug these up yet I am going to move those around I'm not quite sure where I'm going to put them I was using some of my rhubarb leaves as mulch in here in between, you can see this is getting pretty weedy. I really need to go get some cardboard. I need some big sheets. But yeah, so this is gonna be the melon row and that's gonna be fun. I'll put up on the screen the different varieties of melon that I'm growing this year. I'm excited about that. Coming around to the top of these rows, trying not to force you guys to look directly into the sun. This is corn and I'm gonna do a whole video on sweet corn and deciding what varieties of sweet corn to grow. This is the sweet corn from this year, and I literally just planted this yesterday. We got this bed composted with composted chicken manure and ready to go on Sunday. And just literally as I was getting ready to plant, I had the, the wheel planter set and cleaned out and set to the right plate and the right depth, and it was ready to go. It started to rain, and I thought, I'll just wait until it stops raining and then I'll go do this. And then it turned out that it rained overnight. And so the soil was quite wet and I didn't want to run that wheel planter in that really wet soil because it doesn't work well. And so I had to wait until Wednesday. And so this, this all got planted yesterday. So I'm a little bit sore just from being out here working in the garden for most of yesterday. This row is going to be beans of various sorts. And I'm really excited about what's on the end here. This is a tepiary bean which is a different variety of bean. It is a native variety that is grown by the Native Americans historically. And I've always wanted to grow it. I lived in Southern Arizona and it's one of the native beans from that part of the world. And for years and years and years, I've wanted to grow it. It's very drought resistant. And so I'm excited to just see what the plant looks like and to try those out. Um, I finally got some seeds and put them in. And I put them in at the end of this row. This is the end of the strip tape because if they're getting too much water, I can just kink this further up, kind of where that other flower is, and turn the water off on the end section. So I purposely put them at the end so that I could turn the water off on that portion if I needed to, if they were just getting watered too much. In between each of these bean varieties, I have zinnias. And so I like to put plants in between the type of varieties that I'm growing in order to keep track of where things shift. It's not that big of a deal because it's really obvious just by looking at them, but I, it's also just a lovely way to add some beauty, beauty to the garden. Clearly I need to stake this guy. He was straight up yesterday and now he's fallen over with the, the weather. Other beans varieties that I have in here this year are Pinto. That's a cherry pit. My birds have been getting all of my cherries. I didn't have a big cherry crop this year and if I don't net the tree, they literally eat them before they even get ripe. And so that's a cherry pit from a bird. I thought maybe that was a bean seed. Other beans I have in here this year are Whipple Creek, Killarney, and Yellow Eye, which are very, very similar. And so I have them mixed together. And then a mixed variety from Joseph Lofthouse that is just a mixed bean of a whole bunch of different colors and kinds, which is just really fun. And then again, flowers between each group including on the end here. That's another Rubecchia. I had a lot of Rubecchia this year. This is our reseeded cilantro. I had cilantro in here last year that I never got around to harvesting and I let it go to seed and I'm obviously doing the same thing this year. I like to harvest the seed for spice mixes because the seed of cilantro is coriander and so I always grow it for that. But I have video of this and pictures of this from a couple of days ago where the bees were thick in this. And so anything in the parsley family of which this is, 
parsley family, carrot family, is easily identifiable. So umbilaceally, think umbrella. Can you see how that is all coming from a single point and everything's coming out like it's an umbrella? Umbilaceae is the group technically for the parsley carrot family. And this is in that family. I find that anything in this plant family, whether it's dill or fennel or coriander, cilantro, or parsley, obviously, or carrot, the pollinators absolutely love this stuff. And so it's always good to have some of this around just for that reason alone. And so lots and lots of cilantro reseeding in here. I'd have been weeding this kind of selectively. There's another Western salsify. Here's some other lovely Western salsify at the end here, which I'm not sad about at all. Anyway, so that's a little bit of cilantro. I will harvest the seed from that. I'm gonna be better about it this year than I was last year. This is the onion row. I have three different kinds of onions here. And so this first group is Cipollini. And I grow these every year. I've done a lot of production onion growing over the years. And this year I scaled way back. Usually I have a total of three rows of the onion family. So I've done onions and shallots and leeks. This year I'm just doing a partial row of onions for my own use. And then the Cipollinis that are in here, I have one customer who is obsessed with this onion and she buys stuff from me every year. And so I grew these just for her because she loves them. So again, in between I've got flowers. So these are snapdragons. And then I have a red onion, a really decent red table onion that seems to hold pretty well. I find a lot of red onions sprout really early in storage. These guys seem to hold better than most. I'll put the name up on the screen. A couple of more. This is a hummingbird mint flower in here that has just been sitting in, in kind of a holding pattern since I put it out. These were all planted about the same time as the tomatoes, so about mid-May, and I started these onion seeds from seed in March, and I have a video on onions and growing onions and why I think it is so much better to plant them from seed than from sets or from plants. This is my regular yellow storage onion. And so I have a nice little set of those in there for my own use. I'm just literally right now, early June, using the last of my onions from the previous year. And then the most of the rest of this row is flowers. And so I'm gonna be really looking forward to seeing how this looks as we move through. It'll be fun to overlay this video with video from July and August as these really get going. So this is Sahara Rubicchia. Very excited for that. And these have gotten just in the last couple weeks have really started to put on a little bit of extra growth. They've been quite slow, but I'm excited to see those get some room. This is a red and white short Snapdragon called Cherry Twist. And then these are more of the big, tall production of Potomac varieties of snack dragons in here. They probably will need a little bit of staking as they get bigger, but I'm excited to see those. Oh, look, we have starting to get a flower bud. That's fun. And then the rest of this is herbs. And so this is marjoram. Marjoram is a cousin to oregano, but it's not frost hardy and it has a lovely floral aroma. I use it in an Italian seasoning mix that I make. It's a really nice note in there. And I need to get out here and harvest a little bit of these so that they bush out a little bit more. Um, I grew these from seed. Clearly I've lost this one and I might be losing that one and I'm not quite sure why it happens, but a fun thing to grow. Unfortunately, it does go to seed pretty quickly. And so you have to kind of keep trimming it. And then flowers in between the varieties here. So this is more of the signet marigold um, which flowers are edible on this. This is parsley. I make a parsley pesto with pistachios that's really fantastic. It's an Alton Brown recipe. I have a commercial kitchen, so I'm licensed to do this. I freeze it and then sell it in the wintertime through the Walla Walla Food Hub. More uh, signet marigold. And then this is za'atar. So za'atar is a wild type oregano that is used in Middle Eastern cooking. Most of the time when you see recipes for za'atar, which is a mix of sesame seeds, sumac, and some green herb, a lot of times you'll see it with either oregano or thyme. This is actually the plant that is originally what it was made with and what it's made with in the Middle East. And it looks a lot like marjoram, but it's got fuzzy leaves and it is a tender perennial. So sometimes it will overwinter 
but most of the time I find it conks out with the cold. So I'm totally out of my homegrown zatar, and so I'm hopefully growing more of it this year. A zinnia, and this is one of the floret zinnias. I forget which variety. Wait, I can tell you. Dawn Creek Peach. Got a little moth hanging out in the center of that. How sweet is that? I bought that when I bought some replacement peppers and a few other things at a local nursery. I am not willing to pay $20 a seed pack for the floret zinnias in spite of the fact that I think they are stunning. This is a little bit of extra dill that I had and I'll collect seed on that. But again, great for the pollinators. And so not sad at all about that going to seed. Now I see we are having an aphid issue. That's interesting. I don't know if I've ever seen aphids on dill. These were just extra that I tossed in the ground. Um, I'm not a huge dill person. I'm not one of those people that is, it's not one of my favorite spices, but I do like it for the occasional light use in pickles. And again, great for pollinators. It does reseed. You'll see I have some other out here. And then this is my sweet basil. You can see how the the top of these leaves are greening up. It was pretty unhappy when I first put it out here and it was big enough that I just couldn't keep it in pots. I had it in tiny little six packs that I grew from seed and I just couldn't leave it in those pots any longer. And so I went ahead and planted it out and it was still a little bit cool. And so it was pretty unhappy, but it is recovering and it's starting to look pretty good. This is interesting. This one has lost its center. This one has lost its center. That's probably slugs, but I have a bunch of extra basil. And so I'm just gonna replant those, the ones that look particularly rough. I'm gonna go ahead and just replant them. But lots of sweet basil in here. Again, I make pestos and freeze. And so that'll be stuff I stockpile for the winter sales. More of the Sahara rudbeckia. For whatever reason, I had incredible germination on this stuff this year. And so just tons and tons of it. We've been catching gophers. These are black hole gopher traps. I'll put a link below. These, if you have gopher issues, this is definitely what you want to use. They are a really good trap. My husband has been setting these. Generally, I find if I don't catch them in 24 hours, I'm not gonna catch them in that hole and I need to just start over. Um, a few cabbages that were stunted from being in pots. I mentioned that in the previous video. I don't know if these are gonna actually do anything because they just got into the ground way too late. And this is, if you compare the cabbage that I have in my first video, I'll put a clip of it up here, um, and you compare these. Those were started on the exact same day from the same exact seed. So these are stunted because they were in the pots too long. If you have a hard time growing brassicas, that could be your issue. They really don't like to be root bound. And so generally I start them four or five weeks early and then try to get them planted out. And so these are stunted. I'm not sure if they're gonna produce, but I had the room. And so this was overflow again. So we also have a lacinato kale and a couple of red Russian kales, which is my favorite kale to eat. I'm gonna do a video using some of this coming up here in the next week or so. And then more herbs, so a little bit of thyme. These are just plants that had overwintered that I decided to go ahead and plant out. I have a little bit of a nick. Can you see that? I have a little bit of a nick in that hose. And so it's getting, but this is the kind of repair where I won't actually replace or put a splice in because that's minor, it's tiny. It's not hurting anything. This is the Italian oregano, different from the Greek oregano that I have reseeding in my raised bed garden. This is a tender perennial, and I usually keep at least one of these in a pot every year and bring it in so that I can overwinter it. And it's easy to divide and start from cuttings. And so this is the same plant that I've had now for six or seven years, and I just grow it out every year. In between, lots more flowers. So here we have, this is Jolly Jester Marigold. And I've been growing this from saved seed for quite a few years. And it's, it gets quite large and it's just so fun. So it makes a nice divider in between things because it stays tall. And sometimes as the rest of the foliage gets bigger, that can be really good. So the rest of this row is potatoes. And for some reason, this is Elba, I believe. Nope, I lied. Kiuka Gold. So this is Kiuka Gold. 
And this is the only potato, these are all from Save Potato from the previous season. This is the only one that for whatever reason, it just didn't sprout consistently. I think I had six or eight of them in here and I planted them once every foot and I have one, two, three, four, five. So I'm missing at least three. And I've dug down into that soil and the potatoes are still there. They're just not sprouting and I do not know why. So, so weird. In, again, in between, I have these lovely little zinnias. This is queen lime red, which is my favorite. So the rest of this is potatoes. I won't walk you all the way down the row. I am grateful that I do not have a big issue with potato bugs on my particular garden, and they are in our area, but for whatever reason, I knock on wood, I shouldn't even say it out loud, I have not had huge issues with potato beetles in my climate. But the rest of these potatoes look amazing. They're doing very well. They went in a little bit late. I have a whole video on planting these if you want to know all the different varieties. And then they are mulched with leftover leaf mulch that we overwintered last year to keep the weeds down, which honestly has been a godsend. It's really working, and so I'm very, very pleased with that. And then lastly, in terms of vegetables, ah, a few more herbs. I have herbs scattered all over this year. This is culinary sage. This was an overwintered plant, and then I have a spiral herb garden in our yard, and I've got so many baby sage plants right now. It is reseeded like gangbusters. And then this is rosemary, and rosemary does not overwinter in our climate. There are some varieties. Arc is one of them that is a little bit more cold hardy, and I've sometimes gotten a couple of years outside on that, but you can take a cutting of rosemary and put it in water and it, a lot of times it will root. And so you can start rosemary from cuttings and you can also overwinter it as a house plant in the house. If you do that, just be sure that you keep it well watered. If it dries out at all, it will kill the plant. But these three were all from cuttings from last year that I just kept going. And then this one was in my bathroom in a big pot all year. And so this one has overwintered as well. So these are all overwintered from the previous year, and I need to take some cuttings of this to get some more going. But I use a lot of rosemary in my spice mixes, and so I need to get as much growth out of that as I can. Here we have a little bit more of the basil. These look a little bit better, but not great. Again, it's just been a little bit on the chilly side for ground temperature for some of these things. This is my hot peppers, and I don't have a lot this year, just a few for personal use. I'm not doing a lot of production stuff this year, but poblanos, I have discovered that I love roasted poblanos even more than I love the traditional roasted hatch Anaheims. And so six poblanos because I cannot have enough of those in my freezer. I have a Hungarian black. I have a couple of jalapenos. And then this is sugar rush peach. You can tell the difference just in the way the plant is growing. And I really fell in love with that last year for hot sauce, and so wanted to do some more of that this year. This is one shishito that I don't know if it's gonna make it. It's actually cracked at the base, and so I've got it propped up, and it's, it's very fragile, so we'll see what happens here. And then the rest of these are gochugang, which is a type of Korean chili, kind of middle range, not super hot, but I've also completely fallen in love with this pepper for personal use. And it's an early variety. It tends to produce pretty quickly. It's one of the first things that comes out. And so excited to have more of that for my own use this year. I just use it as a chili flake. It's a nice medium heat chili flake, not super hot. I've looked into actually making gochugaru, which is the fermented chili paste you can buy in tubs in Korea that goes into all kinds of Korean cooking. It is very complicated. It is like I do a lot of DIY home stuff and I'm not making my own gochugaru. I'm going to just keep buying it because it's way too much for me. It's kind of like black garlic, too much. And then the rest of this is the tomatoes. And the one thing that I kind of forget every year, if you look at this long ways, kind of down the row, is our airflow, our wind, mostly comes from this direction. So this way is south. And so I forget when I plant these that I need to put the stake on the south side of the plant and stake them to the south side because the wind just constantly comes from the south, especially in May. And so I get these planted out and then I end up with them, like you can see how this one is just bent over towards the north. That happens a lot. And so I just went through here yesterday and restaked a lot of these and was making them more stand up. I am getting some growth on these, 
but it's been slow. We haven't had a lot of heat yet. I've just noticed a lot of nice growth in the last week. And so I'm expecting these to really start to take off. I do have some tomato set on here. A lot of times people will tell you to pinch off the early blossoms because you want the plant to spend time making more roots. We have a great climate here for tomatoes. And I actually really like to leave those early flowers on, the ones that are on even in the greenhouse, because what it means is I get this really small early crop of tomatoes that I wouldn't have otherwise gotten. And then I don't get another big flush of tomatoes for a couple of weeks after I get those first ones. So I just like to leave them on and I give them enough support that they can handle it. This one is Japanese trifle. And this was a trade from a friend of mine and she's got a ton of tomato set. So that's exciting. I'm excited to try this one. These are supposed to be really, really good. I have quite a few purple tomato varieties. Um, I have a whole video on the different tomatoes that I'm growing this year. If you wanna go a play-by-play, -play, I'm not gonna go through that today. But it's nice to see some fruit set out here. I've got some nice ones down here as well. And again, I'm not sad. The one issue is sometimes the weight of the tomato, especially if it's an old heirloom variety, can actually be too much for the plant and it will just bend it over. And so you do need to make sure they've got some good support if you're gonna leave those big tomatoes on. Volunteer sunflower here, not hurting anything. Probably we'll just leave it there. It'll be very shaded out here pretty quickly. There's another couple of baby tomatoes. People often don't realize how long it takes for a tomato to get ripe. You know, it can take from the time a tomato forms and is green on the plant until it get, gets ripe can take well over a month. And so, depending on the size of the tomato, the bigger ones take longer than the small ones. But yeah, it's a long game waiting for tomatoes to get ripe. I'm excited about these this year. I believe this is Principici. Yep, you can see. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. There's a little bit of a point on the end of these pieces of fruit. Just distinct to that variety. It's a little cherry tomato. Yeah, so the tomatoes are coming along. Excited for tomato season for sure. This is all cherries down on this end. I have another spraying hose here. This probably got hit by that tomato cage when we were installing this. It's very easy to do. There's a lovely example of a queen lime red zinnia starting to do her thing. And then at the end of this row, I have the tomatillos. And these are starting to recover and rally a little bit as well. As you remember, I had a lot of edema on the leaves when these were in the greenhouse. Very, very common with tomatillos when they're in a greenhouse situation. They suck up too much water too quickly and it bubbles in the leaves and blows out the cell, cells on the leaves. Um, that Those leaves are finally starting to just completely fall off and I'm getting some new growth here. This is all pretty fresh. But with the wind that we've had, it's been pretty tough. And so this is the result of this banging against this cage and just getting beat up by the wind because we've had a lot of wind. Uh, but they're coming, they're starting to look good. We're starting to see a lot more flowers and I have a tiny bit of fruit on here, but not a whole lot just yet. So we'll see how these do. I believe I have two different varieties of tomatillos in here this year. And this is the glorious sunflower row that is gonna be amazing in a month. It's always surprising how quickly these grow up. And this is a mix of different colors of sunflowers. We'll see what we get. Some of it is volunteer from the previous year. I always have sunflowers in this row and some of it I actually planted. And obviously there's a lot of weeds in here as well that I'm not gonna bother getting in here and messing with. Um, for the record though, it's interesting. Let me see if I can find a good spot that isn't super shaded. shaded. There we go. So in this spot we have obviously sunflowers, but we also have weeds and this one is lamb's quarter, and it is a very, very good spinach substitute when it is this size. And so very, very edible, absolutely delicious. I actually have a video from last year on using lamb's quarter in a spanakopita dish. So very edible. This would be the time to collect this and eat it. It tastes almost identical to spinach, very mild, absolutely delicious. You want it when it's small like this. And then this, it's called red root pigweed for obvious reasons. The root on this is red. 
And this is an amaranth. And you can actually eat the seed. It's very fiddly to do, but you could eat the seed if you wanted to use this as an amaranth seed. Nice protein. Good to know in case of an emergency because they're very weedy and they're everywhere in, this, in the late summer and you could collect seed and sift it and winnow it. But the greens are also edible. And so this is a common edible in the part of the world that this is native to, which I'm vaguely remembering as Peru, but I might be wrong about that. And so this is another green that you could easily just toss into a salad or saute this time of year. These are perfect. Um, and the, both of these are wildly reseeding. And so they're basically a free spring green that I didn't have to do anything about. I didn't have to fiddle with it. I didn't have to prepare the soil. They're just everywhere. And so it's really good to know when your weeds are edible. And basically what's gonna happen here is these sunflowers, there's a volunteer potato in there as well. But basically what's gonna happen is these sunflowers are gonna get tall and they are mostly gonna shade out a lot of the weeds that are in here. And so I'm not terribly worried about all these weeds because the sunflowers are gonna basically drown them out. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what we get. And I may come out here and just harvest a nice handful of some of this to put in the freezer because especially the lamb's quarter, I really, really enjoy. This is a volunteer catnip. So we've got a lot of volunteers in here. And then there's also, I don't know how well you can see these leaves over here, but this is calendula. And so there's also volunteer calendula out here in a very big amount. And calendula, if you get enough of it, it's pretty good at outcompeting other weeds. And it's a medicinal and is great for skin issues. And so I just have it popping up all over the garden. And then of course we have lots and lots of this. And this is a ornamental morning glory. I'll show you pictures of what it looks like when it's blooming. And I let it climb up through the sunflowers last year in here because it was so pretty. And I have thousands, I'm not kidding you guys, thousands of morning glories coming up in here. And so I've been slowly, slowly working on the morning glories and trying to discourage them and pull them out because if, if I let those go, I would really have an infestation and I would never, <laughs> never get rid of them. But sunflowers coming along nicely here. What I've been doing is trying to spot weed this a little bit every day. So I'll spend 10 or 15 minutes out here every day just working on different areas. And doing things like I'll see, like there's a sunflower coming up right there and I'll weed directly around it so that it, at the very least, the sunflower gets an opportunity to breathe and can get some height and not get drowned by that morning glory before, before the sunflower gets big. I've also been transplanting sunflowers into here from other places in the garden. And so a lot of those rows that I just showed you, I just dug up and moved sunflowers. So this is a transplanted sunflower. You can see he's a little bit wilty but is going to recover uh, compared to its neighbors. But I have volunteer sunflowers all over the place. When you do that, just keep as much of the soil around the root as you can in order to minimize your transplant shock. But it works pretty well. And so I've probably transplanted 15 or 20 sunflowers back into this row from other places in the garden that they were just in the wrong spot. And then lastly, I wanted to show you guys, but this stuff is called love in a mist. It is related to the nigella that is growing in my garlic bed in my raised bed garden. Same genus, different species. So this one is an ornamental. I believe the seeds are also edible on this. They have a really, very interesting flavor. But I planted this once in probably 2012. So we're talking 14 years ago. And I have never been without it since. It's really just a lovely little flower. Obviously the bees enjoy it. There's lots of bees in here right now. But we are the exact right climate for this plant where it reseeds. And it comes up in this dense mass. You can see I've got at least 10 feet of this right here. And there's hardly a weed in sight. It is a solid mass of love in the mist. So these guys really do a good job of out competing the weeds in a system. And they're a pretty little flower and the bees enjoy them. And they have these really great seed pods 
this isn't dry yet, but when this is dry, it'll rattle kind of like a poppy seed pod and will be full of seeds, which is why it reseeds so well because they are very, very prolific in their seed making. But these are great when they're dried as part of a dried arrangement as well. So it's just a lovely plant. And I've had it growing out here again for many, many, many years. This patch is a little bit behind and hasn't quite gotten ready to bloom yet, but it's coming. And so love and a mist, I love it. Um, not sad about it at all, even though it is wildly, wildly reseeding. This is Monardia. This is the one perennial I have in this sunflower bed. This is also called bergamot. And it is not the bergamot that is in tea. That bergamot is actually a citrus. And so bergamot tea that's in Earl Grey is different from this. I don't love this as a tea. You can pick the flowers of this and dry them and make a tea out of them. It's not my favorite, but it is really great for the bees. It's very pretty. And this perennial has been in here for 12 odd years. And so I just try to make an effort to not run it over with the mower <laughs> early in the season. And you can see I've got some bindweed that's coming all the way up and just curling through this, which is just unfortunately part of the game out here. So lots of volunteers happening. There's a big volunteer borage. There's a few borage out here around. They're kind of getting drowned out by the love and the mist. But there's a few. And then last but not least, this far row. So this was all peppers and brassicas last year, and right now it's just a weedy giant mess. There's a few things in here that are salvageable, but mostly this is old drip tape. This isn't getting any irrigation. Everything you're seeing here is just from the rains. We've had quite a bit of rain this year. We have yarrow, and this is a lovely white yarrow. So this is medicinal, and anytime I have yarrow and it's not in a bad place, I tend to just leave it. Interestingly, talking about umbilaceae, so we were talking about the parsley and carrot family. Yarrow at first blush seems like it would be in that family, but when you look at the top of this, see how it's not all coming down to one point, like the spokes of an umbrella? This is not Umbelaceae. This is a different plant family. I don't know it off the top of my head. I'll put it on the screen. But there's some little plant ID for you. Yarrow is not in that same plant family. But again, lovely, great for pollinators, good medicinal. Leave it when you can. And this completely blank row that looks like nothing right now, this is sorghum. And I have a whole video from last year on sorghum and harvesting sorghum and making sorghum syrup. I think it's a great alternative homestead sweetener if you're in a climate where you can pull it off. We can just barely pull it off. You really need to harvest it before it gets frosted and it has a long, long growing season. But this just literally got planted yesterday with a wheel planter. And I'm gonna, once this irrigation is done on the current beds, I'm gonna turn this irrigation on and water this and we'll start to get sorghum. It should come right up because the soil's nice and warm at this point, but excited to have a sorghum crop again this year. And it gets quite tall. And so I'm actually hoping it will, it will also act as a bit of a windbreak. And then other random things out here that have just managed to survive. This is anise hyssop. And so I have two of these. There's one in that bed and there's one in this bed. Um, this is a really lovely tea. It has a little bit of an anise flavor to it. Tender perennial doesn't always overwinter. And I've rarely seen it reseed by itself, but it's very easy to collect seed from and save and then start new batches of. And so I've been growing this for, gosh, probably 20 years. The other plant family that all the pollinators seem to absolutely love besides the carrot parsley family is the mint family. And this is in the mint family. If you can see that stem, there we go. If you can see that stem, it is four-sided. Things in the mint family have a four-sided stem. There's probably other stuff that would have come up in here if I were to have tilled this and watered it, but I'm not too Worried about these rows right now. Oh, I wanted to show you the, here's a calendula. So volunteer calendula all over the place. Here's a bed of it. I, I often use calendula as the dividing between varieties. And so it reseeds quite a bit. And there's a volunteer cilantro. But here's what kind of common calendula, not the flashback calendula tends to look like. And so yellow or orange, but this basic lovely little flower and I have, there's a big patch of it right here, several rows over. I've got a patch of it right in here. And so this just volunteers all over the garden. And again, when I have a whole 
and I've got a volunteer to put in that hole, I will often dig these up and move these around, which is why it reseeds all over the place. Uh, not a big deal. Lovely little patch right here of volunteer sunflowers. I think I had a big chocolate cherry sunflower in here in this spot last year. And so it'll be interesting to see what color these turn out to be. But it's actually really fun to let <clears throat> part of my garden just go fallow and to see what is coming up. Obviously, I have plenty of weeds. This is prickly lettuce, which is the bane of my existence this time of year. And I will pull it with my bare hands. And my husband is always just astounded that I do that because it is indeed, as you can see here, quite prickly. And I am always pulling these little stickers out, but it's very easy to pull when it's small. And so I like to, it's very satisfying to pull. And so I like to get in there and yank it out. And then this is sow thistle, if I'm remembering correctly. And this one is one of those ones that it seems like it should be easy to pull and it just breaks at the base when you yank on it. And so I have a lot of this, unfortunately. It is a dandelion type fluff that's spread by the wind when it spreads and it's everywhere in my garden. Pretty little yellow daisy flower, but lots and lots of that. It's very hard to control. I do have some volunteer dill in this bed. This is where I had dill last year. There's one right there. This was saponaria, and I had this planted in about six places out here as dividers last year. This is the only one that reseeded, and I don't know why. I'll show you guys some video of better pictures. It's just finishing up, but this patch right here reseeded like crazy and a ton of flowers. It's a very early plant. It turns out that it's quite frost hardy, which I couldn't find information on when I grew it last year. And so it's one of those ones you wanna start very early because it's literally done by June. But pretty little flower, just lovely. Yeah, and then here is a little bit of more volunteer dill. I've got this in a couple of places out here. There's some right here. Parsley family tends to reseed pretty easily. So there you have it, gang. This is the June 6th, 2024 perennial garden. I'm not doing anything with this arch this year, at least at this point. I may change my mind and throw something in there, but right now there's no irrigation right there. But I'm excited for tomato season as always, excited for pepper season as always. June is always that month of anticipation where you're transitioning from all of your cool season lettuces and spinaches and bok choys and brassicas into the true summer garden of zucchini and onions and peppers and tomatoes and i cannot wait thanks for joining me if you like this kind of content give me a thumbs up subscribe leave me a comment and share i have new content coming out every week often involving cooking the fruits of our labors here in this garden in my other raised bed garden charlie says thanks for watching and we'll see you next time <laughs>